Hey everybody, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Joanna Penn. Joanna Penn is a New York Times and US, USA Today bestselling author of thrillers and nonfiction. So we got both sides of the coin. I'm excited to dive into that. She's also a professional speaker and entrepreneur, voted as one of the Guardian UK Top 100 Creative Professionals in 2013. And her site, The Creative Pen, is regularly voted one of the top 10 sites for writers. It's the place that all writers go um, to get productivity tips on nonfiction, on fiction, all kinds of stuff. Joanna has a lot of great content. Highly recommend checking out that site. We'll talk about that later in this interview. But really what we're going to dive into in this interview is the writing process. Joanna is a prolific writer. Not only does she have the accolades, but she's also got a lot of books. Um, so it's quality and quantity um, and she's she's really known for getting that out and then what i think is really cool fiction and nonfiction, two very different styles of writing we're going to talk about that get into the techniques and all that good stuff but joanna welcome oh thanks so much for having me chandler this is fun well, we're going to have a lot of fun um, on this interview and i want to kind of start it off where did this journey all, all start because I, I know the story, but I'm sure a lot of people don't know it. So where did this start and how did you get into writing? Well, I always wrote journals. So I was one of those, you know, journalists as a teenager, um, but I didn't do any kind of other writing. Um, and I did theology at Oxford. I, again, not, not a very useful degree. Um, but then I went uh, into consulting. So I worked for Accenture, which is a big consulting firm, IBM, things like that, and ended up actually implementing accounts payable systems into large corporates, the very definition of a cubicle slave. Um, and I know, I'm sure many people listening can recognize this kind of life and uh, you know I was kind of in my 30s and just going well, you know what am I doing with my life and I tried to figure out what I wanted to do I started a scuba diving business I started doing property investment and none of that fulfilled me in a kind of creative way I just it didn't set me on fire and I just you know I, how can I find what I love and so I started writing a non-fiction book um, I thought if I write a book about how I can change my life maybe it will help other people and also will help me change my life and that book is called career change and actually it did change my life because I learned about writing publishing started my site the creative pen and essentially from there uh, I it took me three and a half years before I was able to leave my job and uh, I started writing fiction so basically now you know what I am is a you know as you said an, an author speaker and entrepreneur but it's it, it was, it's been probably like a 15 year journey to get here essentially. So I hope that makes people feel a bit better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that it didn't happen overnight. No. You, you talked about writing that first book um, th th about career change that changed your life. Let's talk about that. And then what was that transition like from being able to go from slowly transitioning over to the, the author side of things and being able to quit your job? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, you, you've got to admit, the first book you write, you don't have a clue. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know as well. Uh, nonfiction is a lot easier than fiction. So just, you know, staying with the nonfiction for a minute, uh, you know, creating, essentially, I just, I did a lot of research. So all my books, I do a lot of research. So at the time, I read a lot of books. And I think reading a lot of books is really important and understand what a non-fiction book looks like in the genre you're writing. So I was reading a lot of self-help at the time. And uh, then I just, you know, at the time I was using Microsoft Word, like now I use Scrivener. Um, and I just wrote loads of notes and then gave it a go. And I think I just kind of, made it up as I went along. I didn't do any courses at the time. So, and, and this was, we're talking 2005, 2006, but years ago, like you were probably in like junior school or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I mean, there was no Amazon Kindle. There was, you know, the self-publishing option was Lulu, which, you know, is, you, nobody really uses. Well, I know some people do, but we, most of us don't use that. Um, but essentially it was just kind of and traditional publishing was very much the way to go so but what happened was i i so i wrote it i used uh, what we now would call beta readers uh, i didn't know the term at the time but i got people to read it who were uh, worked with me and said you know do you find this interesting and they would say yes or this needs changing that needs changing and that's a big tip to people you've got to get people in your target market to read your book and give you constructive feedback uh, and I did get an editor at the time as well so I paid for an editor um, and I paid for cover design it wasn't that great 
to be fair. <laughs> I've had it redone since I've actually rewritten the book since the first edition and recovered it and everything. But what I, I guess what I really learned doing that is I loved the process and I loved what I love with writing is being able to go, look, I made this. You know, I haven't got a book handy, but, you know, I made this book and, and it's a finished product. And because what I feel with work, like the day job is you work and work and work. All you get is a paycheck but you never feel you've actually achieved something. And, and especially as a consultant, everything I ever did is obsolete. It's crazy. Whereas with a book, you know, for me, especially fiction, this story can earn me money for the rest of my life and 70 years after I die. <laughs> That's just magic. <laughs> that is magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that you drew the difference there, the difference between making a temporary change to the company you're working for versus making a permanent impact through a product you've created. That's a big takeaway. And I think a big kind of subconscious thing that happens when everything you know, happens to every author, the first time you get that, you don't really, it's, it's just words on a screen. It's just text yeah. in Microsoft Word or Scrivener or whatever you're using. And it, it doesn't really dawn on you until you get that first thing. Like I remember for me, it was like this book, it could stay in my house in an attic somewhere. Someone could buy it. It could stay, and, and like after I die, someone mm. could stumble upon this book and it's actually there. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, wow. it's amazing. I mean, really, it, I, I don't think there's any other business that does this so well, to be fair. And the connection, what I like also is, if, you, if somebody read my book, Career Change Now, you would be accessing my brain. It's like a mind meld across time and space which is amazing too. That's very cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. For so cheap, right? Like there's yeah. all these expensive products and personal coaching and all that. And the thing I love about books is like you get all that distilled <laughs> into a small <laughs> bit that you can read in a few days and mm. for like seven, 10 bucks, you know, 50. Mm. And I would say as well, like that book career change, it sells, you know, whatever, but that book really changed my life. It, I believe I really believe the first book you write will change your life because you either you know like you've written more than one book if you write one book and you enjoy it you will write another book and probably another one and another one if you write one book and you're done you're not you're not an author you're not well you are an author but you're not a writer like you don't you don't because for me I mean I've got about eight books in my head at the moment that I'm you know always, always working on more, more and more books because I love it. I love the process. And so if you write that first book, it can really, really change your life as to what you want to do, but you don't know that until you've done it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And how did, how did that book change your life? Like the process? Well, I, mean, well, I realized that writing was the thing. So I had written a book in order to try and find a business like a scuba diving business or, you know, the property investment thing, which was the thing of making money at the time. And, uh, but by, I actually discovered my passion was in the writing and the learning mm. and helping other people. And that's when I started blogging and podcasting and all that. So in sharing my knowledge, I then started to build the business. So the business came out of a passion, which I know is not what everybody preaches but for me it was very much like I just love this you know anybody who looks at everything I do I mean I just love my life now and compared to when I was super miserable as a corporate slave this is brilliant so and it was you know I realized that I also enjoy this the publishing side because I self-published before it was trendy as I said and um, I enjoyed the publishing process and I enjoy marketing so I think if you enjoy all parts of the process, you can be, uh, you know, an author entrepreneur. If you don't enjoy the publishing and the marketing, then you then you probably best traditional publishing. So it's really great. I mean, the, the process will change your life because you can tell what you enjoy. Got it. And let's let's drill down into the the, the process, but the writing process of, of that first book. And what were the things that you learned by writing that first book on the writing side of things? Uh, it's such a long time ago. It's probably best to talk about writing how I write now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, because I've just written another nonfiction, um, actually called How to Make a, a Living with Your Writing, which is kind of mm -hmm. useful. Um, so essentially now I use Scrivener. So I use Scrivener for everything, for fiction and nonfiction. And with nonfiction, I basically brainstorm, and I would have done this in Microsoft Word at the beginning, but 
Scrivener is great for dragging and dropping. So it's brainstorming all the potential chapters or parts within a topic. So I tend to come up with topics that fit my audience. Um, I have an audience of authors um, for nonfiction anyway. It, um, I may branch into other things at other points, but right now it's just for, for authors. So I think I actually have emailed my list. If people have a list, it's good to ask people what they want to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I actually sent a list of different things and got people to choose. Um, and then I brainstormed the table of contents and then I basically fill in the blanks, fill in each of the content thing. And my editing process, I've actually, I've got a book here, I'll wave it, wave it at you. This is my uh, latest fiction. So you can see here, I print, it, I print every first draft out and I edit by hand that first draft. Um, so it's all printed out. I edit, scribble, and I do that for fiction and nonfiction. Then I type it all back into Scrivener. Then depending on how happy I am with the draft, I may do that process again. So print it all out, handwrite, do it again. Um, then I will give it to my professional editor. So I pay an editor specifically for, uh, you know, for fiction content and structure and line edits. For nonfiction, I'm more confident. So I just pay for line edits. Um, then I give it to my beta readers, and but at this point of where I am, I think when you're at the beginning, you get beta readers and you may need to do quite a big rewrite, whereas where I am now, uh, the beta reader is more about getting early reviews. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, they're less beta readers than early reviewers who pick up last things. And then I also pay a proofreader who is the final person to touch the manuscript in terms of typos and last minute checks and I've got a brilliant proofreader who finds crazy things I mean, she's she's amazing um well worth paying an extra bit of money just a couple of hundred bucks to just you know get rid of that annoying typo that someone's going to find otherwise um but so I I really do invest in that in an editing process um more for fiction than non-fiction but definitely for both um and then yeah then I publish <laughs> so it's writing it, then printing it out, making physical changes. And then you said, you said that you retype. Yeah. I type up the changes into Scrivener. Yeah. Okay. And then, then to the editor, um, then to the proofreader and then to publish. Yeah, basically. Or with beta readers in the middle, depending on what stage you are. Got it. And, and did that, that process look similar when you did your first book or how has that process kind of morphed over time? Uh, well, I think I'm, I've become a better writer for a start. Mm -hmm. I think there is, writing is this crazy, stupid realm where people assume that the first book that you write will be the best book you write, which is just crazy. I mean, would you say that to a musician or an art, you know, a painter? No, it's crap. So I'm on book number 16 now. So I'm a better writer than I was on book one. So certainly book one, I spent a lot of time editing and rewriting but that you know you every time you write a book you learn new things so I think at the time that's why I rewrote that book so the copy of career change now is significantly different to the original book I wrote which you can mm -hmm. only buy on Amazon as a secondhand book now uh, might be worth something one day <laughs> um, but uh, so that's changed I also didn't really know enough professional editors so I just used kind of somebody I knew. The cover wasn't really great. Uh, I mean, where we are now is brilliant because there are freelance editors, freelance cover designers everywhere, whereas back then that just really wasn't happening. Um, so it was much more difficult to find people. So And also I didn't even know um, about that. I also definitely got ripped off <laughs> because mm -hmm. there wasn't really comparison services and there wasn't Kindle or eBooks at the time. So um, I just did a print run, which I would tell people don't do. Don't do a print run unless you have a way to sell the books and distribute the books. Um, I just do print on demand is, is my kind of opinion on that. Uh, but I mean, the, the writing process in terms of going somewhere, putting words on a page, that's exactly the same. It's very, it's very, it was very difficult, I remember, to use Word because you have to copy and paste large chunks and it's very hard to manage. That's why Scrivener is, I think people need to use Scrivener if they're going to do this like professionally with lots of 
books. It's very hard to manage otherwise. Um, yeah, so those are probably the main changes. Okay, and so you were just touching on how you've done 16 books, with, which is a lot. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of repetition there and you become a better writer simply mm. through repetition. But what are, what are some other things that you've done along the way that have made you a better writer be, beyond the repetition? Well, employing professional editors. Um, mm -hmm. For my first novel, I employed probably five different editors at different stages of the process. So like a story structure editor. I got a um, big name editor in America that I paid to give me like a manuscript critique. I got several line edits. I know I got one line edit, which was basically like, you need to rewrite this. <laughs> Rewrote mm -hmm. it, got another edit, you know. So I spent a lot of money on that first novel in terms of editing because learning how to write a story is very different to writing a nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. For the nonfiction, I don't think it's such a big deal. The main thing with nonfiction is understanding uh, the fl flow. I think that's really important and as a speaker you know i know a lot of your listeners will be speakers it's actually quite useful being a speaker because if you're doing say a full day course or you know like you're doing online course you have to lead people through a journey and the book a non-fiction book needs to lead people through a journey as well um and so does obviously a novel um so that's good uh, but certainly paying a professional editor and the editors i've got right now are brilliant i think you move into different categories of editor as you improve you know because some editors won't take you if you're just not good enough um so but you become better and better and every time i get an edit i learn new things about how i'm what i'm doing wrong or what i could improve um i also take courses from people who are making money in the way i want to make money so i take courses uh, at the moment from dean wesley smith um, so people can go to, uh, it's wmgpublishing.com is their course site. So it's Dean Wesley Smith and Catherine, uh, Christine Catherine Rush. Have you heard of them? Mm -mm, I haven't. No, I mean, they're fiction. If people are fiction, I mean, these guys are in their 60s. They've been publishing for like 35 years. They are, um, they have 500 plus books, you know, between them and they make incredibly good money with fiction so for me I want to learn from people who have done what I want to do and I think that's really important um, so and and the thing is that the more you write I mean it's great I've done courses uh, I did how to write a novel like a full year course um, so I you know I keep paying for learning I think paying for learning is really important um, you know I know you believe this too um, Many of us are course junkies, I think. Uh, but I love, you know, I love taking courses and learning new things. I also read a lot. Uh, I read a lot in my genre and learn from what other authors are doing. Uh, I'm not one of those people who says you shouldn't read in your genre. I think you should. If you're writing a business book, you know, like you have, you should read like 50 business books so you understand, you know, how the genre works. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think all of those things, uh, and what's great about being a writer, you will never ever stop learning. You'll never be able to finish. And if you have, then you should probably go and do something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly, it's, it's this lifelong learner mentality. Yeah, which is why it's brilliant career. And you can do it until your brain dies, in which case I wanna die, you know? So when I'm, <laughs> nine, when I'm 95 and my brain's about to go, then <laughs> no, you, you, don't you, make you really it can't do that. No, well, whatever, you know, by then we'll all be on those longevity drugs and we'll all be fine, you know. <laughs> oh, but no, I think what's great and um, what's also great, you know, just on the business side is that the career means the more books you write, the more money you earn. <laughs> so instead of people who get to 65 or whatever and retire and then their income drops, for writers, it just keeps on going up, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which is awesome. Let's face it. Yeah. That's great. Now let's talk about, I love, you. you I'm, I'm going back just a little bit. You touched mm. on learning the art of writing a story. So how did you go from that first um, book, was, which was nonfiction, to learn, like how did you learn the art of writing a story? And, how, and, and, and then later we'll draw on comparisons between nonfiction and fiction. But let's, let's start out by like, how did you go from nonfiction to fiction and learn how to tell a story? Well, uh, first, first of all, I um, I did NaNoWriMo, so um, NA, 
NaNoWriMo, you can spell it out in the notes, whatever. <laughs> um, so NaNoWriMo.org, which is National Novel Writing Month. So I did, you know, I was, I had a blog at that point. I started blogging and I saw NaNoWriMo and was like, do you know I should do that so I can blog about it? There was no, it, I had no intention of ever publishing anything. It was more of a, I should just do that so I can blog about this thing. Uh, so I did it and I wrote, you meant to write 50,000 words in a month. I wrote 20,000 words of some, an idea that I recently found a journal of mine. I had had this idea like year, like maybe six or seven years before that, and I didn't even realize. So it was awesome to find that notebook and realize that the ideas had been noodling around. So I had 20,000 words, and uh, of which I only ever used about 5,000, but it was, a, it was an idea. And when you've been locked in corporate world for a while and nonfiction, you can often feel like you don't have enough ideas or that your idea flow is somehow blocked. So I was super excited because I didn't think I could have had a story idea. And I did. So then I, uh, at that point, I, I started, like many authors, you'll be reading a lot of books on how to write and how not to write a novel and how to write a novel. But at that point, I, you know, you have to get over the hump of from reading all the books to actually writing something down. And you, you can't edit a blank page, so you have to write. You have to fill pages with words. <laughs> and it, that's the hard bit. <laughs> so I enrolled on a course, which was how to write a novel in a year, which was six weekends over one year um, of going to a local library. And, you know, there was a teacher there and we did character one time and, you know. But really the main thing was to have a full year and to have a manuscript by the end of the year. And what was classic, and you know this too, she said um, out of the class, like there were 35 people or something, one or two of you will finish the book. And, and, and I was like, I am so going to finish the book. I'm, and I think I was the only one. <laughs> to be wow. Fair. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, I've had people email me from that class and say, oh, my goodness, I remember you. I still, I'm still working on that book. And this was kind of <laughs> six or seven years ago. So, so this is really important for people. Set a deadline. Okay. Like be hardcore about a deadline because you, the thing you'll hear people say, Oh, yeah, I've been writing a book or writing my first novel for 10 years. <laughs> and it's like, No, get over it, finish the book, and then write another book. If write a book, if the book is crap, put it in the drawer, write another book. Eventually, it won't be crap. Uh, you know, get some editors, that type of thing. But um, so I did this course, and but what I did do by the end of that year, I had. A first draft and then I started going through that um, uh, paying for editors process. Uh, I, I know some people use critique groups but again I, I prefer to learn from people who actually do this professionally or people who do this for a living themselves. Um, I think too many people take advice from those who are not successful in what they're doing. I mean, you have to choose your mentors very carefully. And when I say mentors, I don't mean it in a you know relationship sense. I just mean the books you read, the blogs you read, the podcasts you listen to, the advice you take from stuff. It must be from people who are making money in the way that you want to make money, for example. Absolutely. And I love that you touched on that because that's the reason I dropped out of school. Mm. Is I, I got tired of learning how to run a business pr from professors who had never ran a business. No, <laughs> and it was like, well, this, this doesn't make much sense. Like I'm learning from people who are actually doing this. I should drop out and keep running my business and keep learning from people who are actually doing it. That's exactly right. So be very, you know, be wary. People should be wary of reading books that say how to write a novel by people who might not have written a novel or have only written one or whatever. So yeah, this is, and especially in our days of happy Kindle time, uh, you know, just be wary of who we're learning from. Um, but no, it's great. And I mean, you've got your business books in the, in, you know, Kindle, you know, bestsellers all over the place and, and that, and that, that's the thing you have to prove you have to prove you can do it. So I felt after I wrote that novel, I, I really enjoyed the process, but that first one took me about 15, 14, 15 months. So it was a big, a big deal. And there's, um, if people are interested at thecreativepen.com forward slash first novel, I've got all the videos and blog posts because I was doing videos for NaNoWriMo, everything from the first idea to when I got my New York agent um, and I, um, I launched the book and sold, you know, it was a bestseller. And so it's a really funny process of like 14 months from I haven't got a blooming clue to, you know, getting an agent and all that. So, um, 
yeah, it was really fun. But after that, then I wrote the next second book took about 10 months. Third book took about six months. And then since then, I'm now at about three months, four months for a novel, basically. So did, uh, for that first novel, do you have any funny videos of like you crying and, and like frustrated <laughs> and anything like that? There is, there's one that's really interesting. Um, it's called uh, How It Feels to Put Your First Book into the World. And uh, I'm, I am quite, I'm quite emotional in the video. And the funny thing is, I definitely feel, I don't feel that so much now, but I was scared. What's so interesting with nonfiction to fiction, nonfiction, you are very much focusing on the other person. So, you know, you're teaching something, you're helping someone, you're answering problems. Yes, you put in your personal stories, right, in order to bring it alive. But you're not really sharing your innermost thoughts about God and, you know, faith and sex and all kinds of stuff. Well, you know, you might be. But um, so with fiction, what happens is you're you tend to you become part of the book, obviously. I mean, it's a fictional book about fictional characters, but you end up putting stuff in there that perhaps you haven't shared before and you know that people will read it and they will judge you so for me the fear of judgment is massive I mean it is for many people I'm not so much fear of failure but fear of judgment what people might think of me when they read my books it was like ah, ah. so this video I'm I think I suddenly realized what I'm doing I'm like people are actually going to read this <laughs> it's super scary mm -hmm. so um and that you know it's still it's still but how I you know James Altucher right um, you know, the blogger and his kind of thing is if you're not scared about pressing publish, that you haven't done a good enough job. <laughs> so now I'm trying to lean into that. And that that is, uh, some authors call it critical voice. Um, uh, you know, it, it's sort of self-censorship, uh, not writing. And it's very disrespectful. I asked Stephen Pressfield about this. I interviewed Stephen Pressfield, who wrote uh, The War of Art uh, on my Great podcast. Book. Yeah, amazing guy, like my guru. Um, uh, on, on the podcast, I, I asked him about self-censorship and he basically said, it is disrespectful to the muse. And if you disrespect the muse, then you're gonna lose her and you know you can't do that. So I was like, okay, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, so, sir, Stephen Pressfield. Yes, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that and use that. Yeah. So what was that process of, I mean, was it was it really tough going through that process? It sounds like you enjoyed it, the process of writing your, your first fiction novel. Or, or was, like, what was that process like? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I think, I think the, um, well, a friend of mine, he's an adventurer. His name's Alistair Humphreys. He has, he has a type one fun and type two fun. Type one fun is like, yay, I'm having such a good time. I'm like drinking, I'm at a club or I'm at whatever. I'm, you know, happy in the sun, swimming in the ocean. That's like type one fun. It's fun. Type two fun is when you do something and you look back on it later and it was fun. So you climb a mountain or you cycle up a really massive hill, uh, which I was in Croatia last week, that was type two fun. Um, you know, cycling up a hill, writing a book, it's like type two fun because much of the process might have been quite painful, but you're like, yes, uh, at the end of it. So in that, it's, I love what I do, but it's still hard work to create words. It's actually really tiring, especially fiction. Um, and I've discovered why now. Um, the reason fiction is so tiring is because when, you, when human beings have to make choices, it depletes everything else. It depletes your willpower. It depletes, you know, all the stuff about Tim Ferriss and diet and all that. If you lessen the number of choices you make per day, you have more energy for other things. Fiction authors have to choose every single thing that happens in every sentence of and what happens to each character, which is very, very tiring. And you end up eating loads of cake because you've lost all your willpower. Um, yeah. But so I think in terms of the word enjoy is interesting. I love what I do, but the sense of achievement is what is fun about it. Um, I love making stuff up. Oh, I love all of it. But I wouldn't, the word enjoy is a difficult word, I think. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I love what you were saying about the type one versus two, type two. Yeah. 
I'm definitely going to keep that in my brain and, and keep using that because that's I've never heard someone ex explain that that well. Um, yeah, so that's my total... friend Alistair Humphreys, right? You have to okay. credit him. I'll, I'll credit him, not you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not me. That's definitely him. Yeah. So I, I like that, but then I'd never thought about it from a fiction standpoint, and this is probably because I'm not a fiction writer, but I'd never thought about it from a fiction standpoint that of all the choices you make mm -hmm. and you're you're controlling the entire story and how that could be so tiring. Yeah, it's exhausting. Like last month, I did nearly, I did a lot of words. I did 49,000 words last month, which for me is a lot of words. And uh, for some people, it's not, but for me, it is. And I was so tired, and I had RSI, and my body felt like it was falling apart. And I was just exhausted because um, I was trying to get some drafts finished before my holiday. Uh, but I, and I, this is the thing, I was just so tired. And it's not like digging ditches tired, it's brain tired. Um, but no, it's super, it's a super achievement, I think, to write any book. Um, but for me now, the um, what is magic about fiction, I find at this point, because I've got my process sorted now, um, I kind of, I listen to waves, um, waves and rain and thunderstorms. And I, you know, sometimes I read what I've written and I don't know where it's come from because I kind of go into that. I'm not channeling. I'm not that type of person, but as in I read it and I'm surprised um, by what kind of comes out. But that is me relaxing into not censoring what I'm writing. Um, so that's, you know, that's actually very satisfying um, but I don't know how anyone could describe sitting in a cafe for two hours fun <laughs> in the same way as like swimming in the, you know, in the Pacific or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you said digging ditches tired versus I think I want to step back and pull that out because that's a, I found a very, and that's a, it's kind of a tough realization to have, right? Like I grew up my whole life doing physical labor and mm. I, I was good and I was energized by that. Like mm. I could go out and work a 13 hour day and feel on top of the world and then yeah. the next day do it again. You know, and, it, and there's something energizing, you're getting a workout, you're releasing endorphins. Um, and, and I did that for so long and it was a weird realization to where as you get better at prioritizing your task and as I got into the business world, into the writing world and all that, and I could block all those things out and focus on what really matters, I found myself getting more tired, mm. which was a hard thing to come to grips with at first. And and, 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 and then, like, I remember one of the first businesses I ran was a painting business. And there were some days that I would just want to go out and paint with the guys because that was so much easier to do yeah. than to actually think and solve problems. And so I can, I can totally relate to that. And I think that's mm. something that happens to everyone as they dip their toes, whether it be into the business world or the writing world. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Oh, good. And I mean, this is the thing. I think also having your own your own business and doing this full time is very hard. Um, every year I write a kind of roundup of being an author entrepreneur. And the first year, it's so funny looking back, the first year says, it it is much easier to have a day job. <laughs> You know, even for me, I ha it's important for me to have a little commute to get out the house to actually meet people, you know, because otherwise you just go completely crazy. Um, and actually, it's interesting. I can't create for more than a couple of hours, you know, maybe four hours maximum a day of actually new creative work. And then the rest of it is, you know, interviews and blogging, social media, podcasting, whatever. But the actual producing book work has to be done in the morning for me and it has to be done in, with before about two o'clock, really. And then you schedule your interviews and other things for after that? Yes, and it's I'm very lucky because I'm in in the UK and of course, you know, for you it's the morning. So it's brilliant because mo generally most Americans I could talk to at their lunchtime, morning lunchtime, it's my evening. So that's super. <laughs> that's great. I, I, I function the same exact way. Um, we, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so this is my productive time, and I'm doing an interview. <laughs> but no, I, I love that you said that. I think that's really important because whether you're doing coaching or whether you're doing writing or whatever, like it's great if you are doing coaching to put that in the afternoon. If you're doing interviews, if you're doing calls, mm -hmm. meetings, all those things. So that going back to what you said earlier on willpower, you can use that high willpower when it's the best, um, and yeah. and get in that creative zone. Kind of like. Um, this is drawing another connection. We're going way back here. Um, we kind of like to what you were talking about, about the war of art. And in that book, um, I think it was Somersault said, 
uh, he was asked if he writes when creativity strikes or if he writes on a schedule. And he said, well, with, when creativity strikes, of course. And luckily, creativity strikes every morning at 9 a.m. I know. I think it's Stephen King. It's Stephen oh, King. Oh, Stephen King. Cool. Yeah, I think it's Stephen King who says that. But that, that's the thing. And now I have my process and I, you know, I go to – and I think it's, it's the habit thing. It's the one thing that you – if you do the habit – of now I either go to the library or to a cafe and then I do two hours in one cafe and then I walk to another cafe so I walk across the commons uh, talking about the body thing you really have to look after your body I'm on a Swiss ball I can bounce up and down <laughs> so I get, but to do my back bends I have to do back bends because I was in hospital for like back pain a couple of years ago because as a writer you really screw up your back unless you walk and do exercise and stretching and stuff um so yeah right look after your body everyone um but um i've completely lost my train of thought now <laughs> yeah no, no problem i i did want to touch on um how we talked about this a little bit earlier so your first your first novel Four, I think you said 14 or 15 months, and then yeah, you yeah. said now that process is three months. We talked on how you've gotten better. Is there anything else you want to touch on in that realm of how you've cut that time down from 14 oh, months okay. to three months? So, uh, yeah, so, so the concentrated production time is important in making that habit. So, like I said, going to wherever away from the desk where you do interviews, I think is a good idea, uh, and away from your space spouse your children your if you can get out from away from all of that um and have set your timer and actually make words actually make them in that time uh don't just do something else because you can't think of anything actually commit to that time uh so that's a really big deal and it sounds simple but it's not easy um the other thing is learning uh structure learning your genre more um having a series so I have two series the thing is once once you have a series you have character you have not formula but you have the way the book works usually uh, you have the world so it's much quicker to write books in a series because you just need to come up with a new plot and you know your characters quite well so I have seven books in one series and three in another series uh, and then some other books um, but doing the series is quite good uh, that definitely speeds things up. It also means that people were likely to buy more books because if they like one of the books, they'll buy more. So it's a very good marketing thing too. Uh, but there's, a, you know, you have to, I'm not really an outliner. Like some people are really hardcore outliners. Uh, I'm not, but I'm learning more and more how to do at least a rough outline. And in fact, this book, Deviance, I'm really, really pleased with it because it's a clean draft. It's a pretty clean draft and I'm super happy. It's really like the first, no, the second time now. The last book before this was also a good draft. And um, hat tip to Stephen Pressfield and his uh, business partner, Sean Coyne, uh, who wrote The Story Grid, which is a super book. Um, really recommend that. Again, I interviewed Sean on my podcast early in January and he has a one page outline thing that Stephen Pressfield uses and that's really helped. It's almost like a screenwriting thing, but you have to have your various pivot points. And so if you just have a one page outline, it will help you get past the blank page. Um, so I'm really embracing that uh, with my next book, gonna double down on doing this one pager and then schedule the hours. Now I can normally do between 50, Two th around 2,000 words in that block. So it should only take, you know, 35, 45 days to write the first draft of a novel, like 70,000 word novel, for example. It should take that long. And if it's a clean draft, then you just need to go through the editing process. Um, the thinking time takes time, obviously. So at the moment, I'm thinking about some new series and that will take more time than, than others. But essentially structuring, habitual writing, actual words, and writing, like doing word count. So I've got a, um, do, you, do you think people want to see my calendar? I'll show you my calendar. Absolutely. Um, uh, can't get it off the wall. <laughs> I have a wall calendar. Like some people have spreadsheets. Um, but I have a wall calendar because um, here's my, so here's my, you can see my stickers and things. Do you mm. see stickers? So what I do is I write my word count and I get a sticker if I do really well. <laughs> 
it's for children but um you have to do these things and actually somebody who was it i can't remember who it was but someone says that the your creative site is a child so mm-hmm. you have to keep your child happy your inner child happy um so i have those adult coloring books as well um you know which I, I think a lot of girls like them more than boys but i really enjoy coloring stuff so mm-hmm. i give my i give my creative child permission to do some coloring when i'm doing my writing i do do a bit of coloring and then start writing um so that makes my little writing child happy and then i do my writing and i log my word count and I have my deadlines, as we said. So if you, especially if you're self-publishing, nobody else is going to give you a deadline. So you have to set your own deadlines. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I want to touch on for just a second. Um, what you said, I think that there's a common theme that I've kind of seen in what you were talking about, especially in the sticker thing, but even back to the coffee shop um, thing and switching coffee shops is the you know, the Charles Duhigg power of habit, yeah, like yeah. he talks about the habit. So you have the the trigger, the habit loop, and then the reward. And in, mm. in this case, the, the you know, the trigger might be sitting out, down at your desk. That's mm. not an interview desk. It's your writing, it's your writing desk. Then you have the habit loop of writing, and then you have the reward of getting a sticker if you reach your goal. And then yeah. similar at the, at the coffee shop, you have the the going to the particular coffee shop, that's the trigger. Then you have your writing. Then the reward is maybe a coffee or a treat, but also switching coffee shops and going mm. to the next one. So mm. I, I love how you've kind of infused that in your writing process. It's and taken we, a long time to get to that. The other thing I would say is the audio. Like some, I list, like I said, I listen to Rain and Thunderstorms on repeat. It's the same album, just over and over and over again. Um, the same rain and I think it, it's like a gets my brain into a certain state I think what that some kind of white noise it shuts out the coffee shop noise But it also for me rain and thunderstorms is means right so as soon as I hear rain and thunder, it's being British I know you live in California <laughs> <I think. laughs> mm-hmm. Being British. I'm like right. It's raining. I must do something <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so I think I whatever mu- some people listen to like different music all the time or have one album for a particular book, but I just listen to as soon as I hear rain, I'm writing. So that helps me too. That's great. Now, how do you balance writing on a book project versus writing for your blog? Cuz I'm sure both of those kind of go simultaneously or how does that work? Well, it used to be that I would blog primarily and then I would write books later in the last year or so 18 months I have actively written blog posts to go into books so my last book was business for authors how to be an author entrepreneur which was very you know structured around how to run a business um, as an author and so I was I I kind of it's interesting you ask this because I am actually at the point where I'm doing a weekly podcast and I rarely write blog posts now got it Um, so I'm kind of saving my writing for books uh, or things like I wrote a really massive post the other day on pros and cons of being a, an indie author. That was really big and that won't go into a book. And I wrote that because I went to a conference and met a whole load of authors who were unhappy with their lot uh, in traditional publishing. So I write for the blog when I have something to say. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And you know you know how it is in the self-publishing niche. You know, when I started my blog in 2008, there weren't many people talking about it. Now there's a lot of people talking about it. So I'm not just going to write and yet another whatever post um so i write something when i've got something to say uh, or it's a podcast so um and i don't do guest guest blog posts anymore written ones i save my words for uh books um but i'm always happy to do podcasts or audios mm-hmm. great and now one one final question and final thing to riff off riff off of um before we wrap up is productivity tips for writers so you touched on Scrivener a little bit um, earlier and how that how that kind of goes with your writing process. What other tips? We can dive on Scrivener. We can talk on other stuff. What are some other kind of productivity tips, hacks that you use that you feel like would be helpful for, for people writing their first book? I mean, most of them we've covered, like, in terms of mm-hmm. the music and the you know, cafes and um, – I mean, Scrivener really is the best tool for for writing, absolutely. Uh, I don't know how people manage without it. Uh, I don't, you know, to be fair, I don't think I have any more productivity tips. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
<laughs> Max, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess I should say that when I had a day job, so I did my first like five books when I had a day job uh, and as a consultant, so I was working, you know, long hours, um, I would get up at five and write. So before mm. work. So, uh, and then in the evenings, then again, I would build, I was blogging and podcasting and things in the evening, but in the morning I would get up really early and write. Um, and then I, on, I took Sundays as well uh, and did that the weekend. And then eventually I moved to four days a week in my day job. So I made the decision. And it's a big deal for people. It's like 20% of your income that you give up. But I just was at that point where I couldn't, I, you know, you're like, oh, if I only had a bit more time, I could actually achieve something. So I moved to four days a week. But you can only do that if you make a decision that this job doesn't matter. And that's very hard for people. I realize that you have mm. to say, look, this job is just to pay the bills. It doesn't matter. I don't have to go up the corporate ladder. I don't have to really, I just have to do what I'm paid to do. And then I'm going home to do my real job, which is to write books or I'm doing that before work or whatever. So everyone can make the time. It's just, what are you going to give up? And for me, it was a bit of sleep <laughs> and TV. We got rid of the TV. Um, now, I mean, now we download shows and stuff, but like, and choose what to watch. I think that's a really big thing. Like choose what you put in your head. Stop just mindlessly watching the news. Like in America, it's shocking what your TV is like. It really is. <laughs> like your terrestrial TV, you have some brilliant TV shows, but your, you know, your news cycle and all that, it's just, you can just feed your brain just crap. So like stop doing that and you'll have, and miraculously have a couple of hours that you can spend <laughs> doing that. So those two things, to, you know those three things really going part-time getting up early getting rid of the tv um or at least you know having a diet an information diet or a tv diet is a, is a really good idea um and then i guess the last thing i would say is you know this is such a brilliant career but i've also learned it's not for everyone so i think there's real peer pressure in our niche now to for everyone to be like yeah you must be full time and you must be writing loads of books and you must be making seven figures from your books um but what i've kind of learned is that everyone's got their different way of doing things and some people are much happier writing slowly and writing one book or maybe they're a speaker first and their book is a secondary income um, you know that type of thing so I want to say to people uh, this is fantastic however you're gonna do it or maybe you're just writing that one book and that one book will help you with what you want to say to yourself even if it doesn't sell loads of copies that one book could change your life so, um, you know, definitely write it, definitely publish it and then decide whether you want to do another one. But, uh, you know, we love this. I think that's a great place to end it. We talked about some final tips. Um, we, we found some in there. Um, we, you, you pull them out of the, out of the bag and that was a great place um, to leave people with is if, if you want to do this and like you said, it's not for everyone, but if you want to do this, you have to find the time you have to make the time, whether that's getting up early, getting rid of the TV, um, however you have to do that, taking taking some time off of work, you have to make the time. It's not just gonna come there. So Joanna, thank you so much for sharing this. I think this has been really helpful, especially on the writing side for people who are thinking about writing that first book. And now they've got some tactical information. They can see not only how you've done it, um, but your best recommendations. So thank you for that. And before we head out, where's the best place for people to learn more about you and to find out more? Thank you. So my site is thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And I also have the Creative Pen podcast, which you can find on iTunes or at thecreativepen.com. And I'm on Twitter at thecreativepen, surprisingly enough. And uh, my fiction is under JF Pen, F for Francis, if uh, anybody's interested in some kick-ass thrillers. Awesome. Joanna, thank you so much for coming on. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Chandler.